Welcome, this is, This Week in Prophecy, with, James Jacob Prash. Today is January, 15, 2020, from the UK, Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and welcome to This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. We're still in Great Britain, soon going to the Middle East. Nonetheless, let's begin with This Week in Prophecy. Apart from the events in Great Britain surrounding the crisis in the monarchy with the royal family, which we've dealt with on a separate video and a separate broadcast, we're going to be focusing, as usual, on the Middle East and this week also events in Washington, D.C., concerning the impeachment of President Trump. As always, we want to look at these things from a biblical perspective, particularly where there's some potential prophetic implication for these things. Well, beginning in Washington, it's been an absolutely incredible week. The way that we have seen left-wing members of the Democratic Party attacking President Trump for what he did in Iraq and in Iran, but remaining silent of the fact that there are protest demonstrations in Iran, large ones involving students refusing to walk on top of American and Israeli flags, as is the common practice in their protests, rather protesting the Mullah regime. Some of them calling for the resignation of Ayatollah Khamenei, the heir, the successor of Khomeini. They're remaining silent. They predicted there would be tremendous negative ramifications for the United States and for world affairs and for the Middle East, because Mr. Trump managed to remove someone responsible for the death of between 603 and 608 Americans, killing thousands more. Yet he was made the villain by the left-wing press, even being called an assassin by Chris Matthews in the United States, as we pointed out, and Soleimani, Custom Soleimani, being praised by figures within the American left and the American Islamic community. This is a shame and a disgrace. Again, when you had a member of Congress saying that the United States assassinated a foreign leader instead of calling him what he is, which is exactly what Congresswoman Omar did, it's beyond absurd, beyond the pale. The ramifications thus far have been nothing but good for the region and for the United States and even for Iran. But let's continue looking at this week in prophecy. Because he has blessed Israel, saying that Israel has a right of determination in the West Bank and a future voice in its outcome, refusing to call it a occupation because he has moved the embassy to Israel's capital, Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv, because of his general philo-Semitic and pro-Israel policies. This is one of the reasons Mr. Trump has come under tremendous attack. We believe this attack is spiritual in nature, not simply political or social. We also believe because of his pro-life policies and his appointment of constitutional judges with pro-life leanings, he's coming under satanic attack being orchestrated by the devil working through the godless American left who's so radically pro-death that is pro-abortion. There's a spiritual nature to these unreasoned attacks on Mr. Trump. Is he perfect? No. Do I always personally agree with him? No. Do I always pray for him? Every single day. Yet, we were told there was a sense of urgency to impeach him, to remove him from office. That even though it's an election year, what he's doing is so dangerous to the future of the country, we can't wait. And then Nancy Pelosi waits a month before presenting the articles of impeachment. This is absurd and hypocritical. 
She's not going to persuade anybody to change their position, behaving the way she has. Nonetheless, in desperation, that is the climate in which we were in. We now have a situation where there were members of the Democratic Congress and Senate saying that the articles of impeachment must be presented. She wanted certain guarantees from the Senate as to the way that the trial would be conducted. The indictment, as it were, the impeachment was ran through the House of Representatives by her and Adam Schiff without any due process, without any cross-examination of witnesses, or without Mr. Trump being able to have his lawyers call his own witnesses. While Adam Schiff claimed that there were certainly going to be a presentation in the impeachment of extortion and bribery, the articles of impeachment contain neither. Alan Dershowitz, himself a liberal Democrat professor emeritus from Harvard, nationally renowned as a constitutional lawyer, says there's no high crimes or misdemeanors. And so it begins. We particularly urge prayer for Mr. Trump's legal representation. His personal lawyer, not Mr. Giuliani, which is a counsel to the presidential office on legal affairs, but his personal lawyer is Jay Seklow, a constitutional lawyer who I've worked with some years ago in, I'm trying to keep it vague here, an evangelistic organization. He took a case of Los Angeles International Airport to court in favor of an evangelical organization's right to share tracts. He is a committed believer. He's Jewish. He's a Jewish believer in Yeshua. And uh, again, I know him personally, very good lawyer and a, a good believer, and he's Mr. Trump's personal attorney. He will be co-leading Mr. Trump's defense in the impeachment trial in the Senate. Uh, he's one of several believers surrounding Mr. Trump, whose numbers also include Vice President Pence, who was a born-again believer, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who's a born-again believer. Now, again, it is controversial that these men are former Catholics, or they're, they're Jewish believers. The left-wing media would pick up on these things, I would have expected, but they, they fortunately have not, although they are certainly aware of it. They are certainly aware of it already. Nonetheless, that may just be God keeping them quiet. Um, they don't like the fact that Mr. Trump has evangelical influence surrounding him. And I'm surprised they haven't made a bigger deal of it than they already have. Nonetheless, it's going to commence. Miss Pelosi has not had her own way, and she's going in with an impeachment that contains no high crimes or misdemeanors. A very weak case where their one Factual witness, not opinion witness, but factual witness said there was no quid quo pro that he saw. When Mr. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, said there was no quid quo pro and the transcribed telephone conversation between Mr. Trump and Mr. Zelensky said there was no quid quo pro. As we've said, no prosecutor would take up this case in the secular realms of the judiciary. It would be too bad of a case to even bother with. You can get an indictment for anything, but it would not be worth prosecuting. It would have been thrown out had it not been politically motivated by Nancy Pelosi, Adam Schiff, and the left wing of the Democratic Party, which is most of the party now. Well, such it is. It's coming up, but I, again, believe it is part of a spiritual attack because of his pro-life position, because of his pro-evangelical position, that has included standing up for the rights of persecuted Christians of his by his administration, and because of his pro-Israel position. I believe he is coming under attack. Is he perfect? No. Do I trust him? I don't trust anybody but Jesus. I don't even trust myself. But I pray for him, and I pray every day for him, and I would urge you to do the same that justice would prevail, and that these baby-butchering 
same-sex marriage proponents, pro-abortion proponents, would be brought to justice. That does not seem to be what's happening, however, this week in prophecy. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roberts, has allowed an Obama-era anti-Trump political activist to direct the revisions needing to take place in the FISA court system. The FISA courts were guilty of irresponsibility in listening to the Justice Department when the FBI lied and continued to lie in order to protect and cover up their first lie on the Steele dossier. The FISA court became a political instrument, as did the FBI under McCabe, under Comey, and under Peter Strzok. The criminal investigations by a special prosecutor, Mr. Dorm, are taking place. I hope they will bear fruit. But that only involves the crimes alleged to have taken place within the Justice Department and the FBI. The malfunction of FISA itself is being redressed by an anti-Trump political activist. Why is Chief Justice Roberts, a Republican appointed by the Bush dynasty, doing this and allowing it? Why is Roberts allowing it? We have warned many times, establishment Republicans are no better than Democrats. They are everything a Democrat is, plus a liar on top of it. We've pointed out many times, it was the Earl Warren Supreme Court that ordered God out of the classroom, that it was the Warren Burger Supreme Court that ordered God out of the maternity ward with Roe versus Wade. It was Ronald Reagan's appointee, Sandra Day O'Connor, wrote the decision on the Texas anti-sodomy law that opened the door for same-sex marriage and who ordered the Ten Commandments out of the judicial building in Alabama. Order God out of the courts, order God out of the maternity wards, order God out of the classrooms. These are Republicans, establishment Republicans. Every one of them, every one of these chief justices. And now we have Mr. Roberts, again, from the Bush administration, establishment Republicans, a corrupt administration that was owned and operated essentially by the House of Saud after September 11th. We've talked about the relationship in the Carlisle group and the relationship between the Bush dynasty and the House of Saud, funding radical Islam, even in the United States, many times. So we have Mr. Roberts, establishment Republican. Remember, Mr. Trump ran not only against the Democratic Party, he ran against the Republican Party establishment. The Bush dynasty, Carly Fiorino, the late John McCain, Mitt Romney, etc., sometimes called the never Trumpers. Well, Mr. Roberts is their boy. Mr. Roberts is responsible for Obamacare not being struck down in the Supreme Court. In the litigation brought against Obamacare that reached the Supreme Court, it was contended that Congress cannot force people to buy private insurance. Mr. Roberts unilaterally rewrote that law. He rewrote the legislation, calling it a tax, even though the legislation did not say it was a tax. He rewrote it to say it was a tax, and Congress has a constitutional right to pass tax legislation. This is the kind of corrupt judicial garbage the Republican Party leadership has always been and represented. From Roe versus Wade to the Warren decision kicking God out of the classroom 
the Sandra Day O'Connor kicking God and the Ten Commandments out of the judicial building to Mr. Roberts. These people are just as wicked and just as evil as left-wing agenda is judges, except they lie on top of it, pretend to be somehow conservative, hiding on back of the mask of the Republican Party, pretending the Republican Party is conservative, when in fact, no, it is a mainstream party that has a conservative wing, but it's not a conservative party, never was. Mr. Trump had to run against it, and they are still against him. I was not particularly happy with Mr. Kavanaugh. I'm not convinced Mr. Kavanaugh is a genuine constitutionalist or a genuine conservative. I like Clarence Thomas. Although he was a Catholic, I thought Mr. Scalia, who, who we've lost, was conservative. At least he was a fair constitutionalist. And I appreciate and admire Clarence Thomas who was horribly victimized, as was Kavanaugh. I don't, however, trust the Supreme Court Republicans. I don't trust them. Mr. Gorsuch may be the best of a bad bunch, but simply because they're Republicans does not make them men of honor. In fact, Mr. Roberts, the Chief Justice, is a man of dishonor. How, in the aftermath of those scandals, when the Democratic Party misused FISA, misused the Justice Department, misused the FBI, this was the Democratic Party working through the Obama administration, how can you appoint an Obama-era bureaucrat and an anti-Trump political activist to redress the problem when they caused it. Again, that is like <laughs> having the mafia audit the numbers racket or having the mafia audit union corruption, the, the dues books of the Teamsters in the, in the Hoffa era. Well, the mafia will do the audit. It's absurd. It's no less absurd. But this is the hypocrisy of the mainstream Republican establishment. This is the hypocrisy of men like Roberts and men like Bush who appointed him. Do not think that these men are men of honor or principle or integrity. They are men of dishonor who have no principles and no integrity. To take a law, for a judge to rewrite legislation and call it a tax when it was not legislated as a tax in order to force Obamacare through. This was a Republican appointed by Bush. Remember, it was John McCain who legislatively saved Obamacare. The Republican Party establishment is different from the Democratic Party establishment in only one respect. The Democratic Party establishment is 100% godless filth. The Republican Party establishment is 110% godless filth because they pretend to be constitutionalist and conservative and pro-Judeo-Christian, which they are not. Get God out of the classroom. Get God out of the maternity ward, abort the babies, get God out of the court system. And now, Roberts goes with this? An Obama-era anti-Trump activist going to clean up FISA after FISA was misused unconstitutionally and illegally to attack Mr. Trump? How is this possible? Only an establishment Republican would be that hypocritical. Only an establishment Republican could be that low. Only somebody appointed by a villain, a Saudi-owned villain, like 
the Bush dynasty could do something this low. Mr. Trump has spoken out about it. But constitutionally, there's a separation of powers. I just hope and pray that the judges he appoints will be constitutionalists. They will not be Republicans. Remember, the Republican Party is no better than any other party. It's just as bad and just as evil. Open democracy. It's part of the attack on Mr. Trump. Why is this happening? These attacks are spiritually motivated because he's blessing Israel and because he is pro-evangelical, because he is pro-life. The attacks from without, from the Democratic Party, from the left, from the left-wing media, that's anticipated. But the real poison is ad te brute. Those absolutely despicable and unprincipled people within his own party. And the Chief Justice is, of course, one of them. The Mormon Mitt Romney is another. But let's continue this week in prophecy. Events in Iran have once again managed to shift gears. With the protests in Iran, there have been further developments. This is really, really major. Yesterday, this week in prophecy, in its 2020 Intelligence and National Security Assessment, done annually by the Israeli military and civilian intelligence communities, the Shabak, Amman, which is the military intelligence, and the Mossad, put together a document advising the Israeli government and friendly foreign governments on policy based on intelligence assessments for the year. They state in the 2020 assessment that Iran will have the capacity to produce 25 kilograms of highly fissionable material before the end of 2020, by the end of the year. Within two years, they will have a more developed weapons system capable of launching nuclear strikes with a missile. And the assessment points out that the funding for the research that allowed this to take place came courtesy of Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and John Kerry, the $150 billion in unfrozen assets. Those assets belonged to the Iranian people if they were unfrozen. Instead, they went into the hands of the mullahs and Soleimani and company. They're not used to help the Iranian people. They were used to fund terror and to develop nuclear weapons. Of the 10-year slowdown allowed by the Obama administration's agreement with the Iranians, only six years are presently left. What it amounts to is the ability to resume full-scale production of weapons-grade plutonium, any enrichment, whatever, in six years. Paid for by Barack Obama. So he funded it. Additionally, it allowed research to continue. It allowed the development of missile systems to deliver nuclear weapons to continue. And there could be no unannounced inspections of nuclear research and development facilities, they had to have 30 days notice. And they were given the bonus of approximately $151.7 billion, $1.7 billion delivered secretly in cash, in addition to the unfreezing of the assets. 
This is unbelievable. It would be hard not to see the actions of the Obama administration as anything less than functionally tantamount to treason in the eyes of objective thinkers, at least. He gave them $150 billion. We, we can't inspect your nuclear development facilities, and you can resume after 10 years, of which there's only six left, and you can continue to develop weapons and to fund terror to kill Americans, and we'll pay for it. This was the foreign policy crowning achievement of Barack Obama. This is his legacy. His domestic legacy was the failed Obamacare that collapsed despite the efforts of Republicans like John McCain and Chief Justice Roberts to save it. But these things are now coming to a head this week in prophecy. If the Israeli assessment is correct, United States, Europe, Israel, the moderate Arab states, the rest of the world will have no more than two years to do some kind of a preemptive strike on Iran, lest Iran gets those weapons. To prevent it from getting the nuclear device, it could have by the end of this year, if the Israeli assessment is correct. The best would be an international reaction. Don't hold your breath. Nonetheless, what's taking place? This is a major, major development, this 2020 assessment by the Israelis, if it is accurate. And the indications are that it most likely is accurate. This is very serious. Now remember, although we made the light that there's protests against the mad mullahs, and that Iran has essentially backed down, the mad mullahs are determined to preserve their regime. What they will likely do is what they've always done when confronted, back down, but not be deposed. This is not the first time this has happened. It happened during the Obama administration, except Obama would not lift a finger to even give an ounce of credence or moral support to the protesters. He essentially seemed to be on the side of the regime. Functionally, him and John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. Well, Mr. Trump is different. He has given his blessing to the protesters, making it clear the United States is not the enemy of Iran, but that the mad mullahs who've hijacked Iran are the enemy of the Iranian people and the American people and the Saudi people and the Israeli people and the Emirate people. And so it is. This week in prophecy, Israel has hit the T4 base in Syria, which is an Iranian-operated base, and has killed at least three Iranians. The Iranians, meanwhile, have fired another missile on an American base on the 14th of January, after the one that took place on the day when two missiles downed the commercial jet, killing 176 people. Most of the passengers were Iranian Muslims or Iranian Canadian dual national Muslims. I personally believe that this was God's hand of judgment, although I do obviously mourn the death of the innocent people on board particularly the Ukrainian flight crew. We warned last week that it was likely that Iran shot this plane down, and our suspicions have proven to be accurate. After three days of denying it, they were forced to admit it happened. During those three days, they did not present the black box, nor 
did they allow international investigators to observe the wreckage, but began scooping up and trying to clear the wreckage away. They've also claimed to have arrested the Iranian who filmed the missiles being fired at the plane. And it was not only one, it was two. This week in Prophecy. The further predictions of the American left, the Democratic Party, and mainstream media that there is a disharmony, a disconnect with the European allies and NATO over America's Iranian policy after killing Soleimani has proven to be nonsense. Britain, Germany, and France have all admitted that Iran has been acting in violation of the treaty that Barack Obama bribed them to accept. They've not even kept it. The Europeans, the British, the French, and the Germans have stated these violations are taking place and they are taking potentially punitive action under the provisions of the treaty for those violations. Iran has promised a strong and severe response. The conflict now is what Daniel 10 said, as we pointed it out last week in Prophecy, to be a conflict with the West. Europe at that time was represented by Greece, and just as there had been a conflict at the time of Philip of, of Macedonia and Alexander the Great, there would be another such conflict with the West. Now the nations of Europe are lining up. Israel right in the middle of the proverbial mess and Iran behaving the way Daniel chapter 10 said. Powerful demonic forces, the prince, the principality of Persia. Although Iran has seemed to back down from conflict with the United States, and although it is struggling economically internally and being challenged, remember, the mad mullahs are demonically controlled. There are powerful demonic forces over that country. Let's continue. Desperate people do desperate things. If the Israeli report is correct again, and the mullahs begin to fall from power, would they resort to using these weapons of mass destruction, or at least threatening to do so? I think we all know the answer to that. Would this precipitate a response by the Israelis or by other countries? I don't think they'd have a choice. This week in prophecy. Daniel 10 may have been written 2,400 years ago. But it could be on the front page of any leading newspaper in the world this week. Let's continue looking at what's happening this week in prophecy. For the very first time, Israel has sold natural gas from its Tamar and Leviathan fields to Egypt. The deal is worth approximately 15 billion US dollars and will extend over several years. Hence, we have now the mass production of fuel resources off the Mediterranean coast of Israel that are being commercially marketed in amounts that are significant. It's only the beginning. The value of Tamar and of the Leviathan fields is difficult to assess because of fluctuations in oil and gas prices. But it will make Israel at least a regional player in the energy equation. This week in prophecy, we see events taking place politically in both the United States and in Israel. In Israel, the right wing parties who are not in the Likud are forming a loose electoral confederation to oppose Mr. Netanyahu in the upcoming elections. 
The National Religious Party, the Religious Party of Israel, although there are smaller ones like Shas, the National Religious Party is the largest, is forming a coalition alliance with Ayelet Shachat and with Natali Bennett, two right-wing politicians, to try to make an alternative to the Likud party of Mr. Netanyahu. Hence, we have the equivalent of an American primary, uh, a war among people of the similar party persuasion. Only the parties have split. It's like having a conservative party and a Republican party at the same time contending with each other. Well, that's what's taking place now in Israel. If this divides the conservative vote, it could result in the left gaining an amount and degree of power it would not otherwise have. Or it could result in a humiliation for them. When religion enters politics and the religious have the swing vote, we have to be very, very cautious. It could spell opposition for the local believers in the body of Christ. It could spell a lot of things. We may be initially happy, but we shouldn't be. But it's happening this week in prophecy. So this week in prophecy, we see these events coming together. The aftermath of Iran. The left finds itself politically embarrassed. I have no doubt that the prayers of so many Christians for Mr. Trump has been the determining factor in the positive outcome of the events of last week concerning the assassination of Qasem Soleimani and what followed it. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.